Today's guest is Cyrus Kirkpatrick. He is a digital nomad, supernatural researcher, and author who focuses on life after death and out-of-body traveling. Cyrus, thank you so much for joining me and welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. Since you have all this experience in life after death, you must have had some experiences yourself with either out-of-body traveling or something supernatural. So can you give us examples of some of the most impactful things that's happened to you? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot, I suppose. And well, I grew up in a ranch out in Tucson, Arizona, and weird supernatural stuff kind of came with the territory out there, quite literally speaking. So especially among my parents, siblings, people having experiences out in the desert of UFOs coming down and orbs in the sky and uh, Native American spirits walking around. I mean, my father saw like a satyr type of entity one time, like walk across the road, look kind of like a, kind of like a cross between like a dog. And you know, you'll, you'll see like Native American depictions of those things are very interesting, like long skinny legs and just one thing after another, but I didn't necessarily experience much of that myself but i was always really interested in life after death i think because i had too much time on my hands when i was younger growing up out in the woods you know thinking about things that a lot of younger people shouldn't be thinking about <laughs> and yet i was too scared about like out of body experiences i don't you know i was afraid of actually having one my brother used to have them and talk about them and he'd also get some negative experience out of it so it just spooked me and i didn't want to go down that road so every time i began to have like an out-of-body experience where i felt myself like vibrations energy like uh like energy building into my in, in my body or my chakras whatever you want to call it and then beginning to exit my body i would block it and stop it immediately from happening sometime in around 2014 and i i don't really know what triggered it but i, be, I began having full-on out-of-body experiences that would basically graduate from leaving my body in my bedroom into astral projection where I'd be taken into a different plane of existence. So the first time this happened, I was renting this little house in my, after I moved to Los Angeles. And so I was just like, I don't know, I was sort of trying to pull my life together, kind of stressed out, taking a nap in the middle of the day. This is again like 2014 had an experience where I was basically pulled out of my body, almost like an external force. Like I saw my, my astral body floating in the mirror. Like I'm like doing this floating above my body, looking around, like what's going on. And I kept getting pulled up, 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 saw like the attic of the house for a minute. Cause I wasn't there. And then I was looking down at the house, looking down at the neighborhood. And then suddenly I was in kind of this temple complex and lots of bushes, lots of trees and I was actually physically there, which is really difficult to process when it's happening because it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, you're like, why am I here suddenly? And then I had an experience actually with a couple of people I met when I began just wandering off into the woods. Uh, actually, it was, a, it was a Hindu couple. Kind of looked like it came straight out of a Bollywood film or something. You know, really, really good looking. Um, and they came up to me and I was tripping out, completely, completely tripping out. And uh, it appeared to be some kind of like a temple for people uh, learning, you know, spiritual subjects and things like that, which kind of makes sense, I guess. And I got a, you know, a whole little lesson about like you're having out of body experience and these experiences probably keep happening to you and don't panic. And, um, you know, I, I, you might feel like you're in two places at once. But that's just how it's going to be for a while because you are in two places at once and a lot of lot of ideas like this. And so we had this discussion about this and then the experience ended and I fell back into my body. And then after that, I probably had like, you know, I don't know. I don't know how many for a while I was probably having four or five experiences a week. Not not often as as um, like vivid and crazy as that one. But, you know, like stuff began happening after that. And um, there's a lot more, you know, there's, there's been a lot more experiences where that one came from. And uh, there's there a similarity, especially with that first one, I suppose, like a near death experience. But of course, I wasn't near death. I was um, perfectly healthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, I've, you know, a lot of other spirit communication types of experiences, experiences with my, my mother after she passed away, with my father after he passed away, with my brother after he passed away. Unfortunately, like most people in my family passed away. But um, anytime somebody does, it's like because I have the ability to kind of get out of my body, then they can meet me halfway and make contact. Whereas I think with a lot of people, they're not able to do that. 
So I've had no shortage of experiences with like the spirit communication either. So that's, that's the, that's the long and short of it. So I'll take it back to you. All right. Well, I noticed that you said that they told you not to panic. And I was already thinking this before you said that the first time that you really got out and were, were, you know, going quite a bit of ways from your body. Were you ever worried like, Hey, am I going to be able to get back? Um, I don't think so because for me, it always feels like I'm being pulled back in. Uh, maybe originally when you don't understand how it, how it operates, I think a lot of people feel that way because again, they don't understand what it's actually like to be out of your body, which is, it's kind of like having a crappy Wi-Fi connection and trying to keep it active without losing it. <laughs> so once you've been out of your body enough, that's not an issue, but for some people it might, might actually be like some, I've heard in the literature, you know, like a lot of guests on my, show, some guests on my show and people I've spoken to who have had experiences where it's almost like they're, they're so disconnected from their body here. They actually have to wonder if maybe they died. And, but I've never had an experience like that. It is interesting that some people do get those types of experiences too. But for me, it's been the opposite issue. Have you ever heard of anything like this? While somebody was gone, someone else slipped in and took their body and took off. <laughs> yeah, that- the wa- the walk-in phenomenon. Well, like many, like dealing with negative entities on all levels, that's impossible unless you give consent, hmm. which unfortunately people have experiences and they don't they, they bumble along they're not educated so basically if you leave your body and then there's some weird entity that like tries to make a deal with you and says hey you know be really cool i'll bet i could i'll bet i could get so much done if i just went into your body and you're like oh okay then you could you could literally be opening yourself you know opening doors or i should say metaphorically opening doors to something really bad but this is this is this is not common stuff like if you're fostering negative entities and issues like that you shouldn't be trying to go out of your body and you should actually be canceling the experience because you don't you don't actually want to be dealing with things like that so i'm not saying so i'm saying it's possible but i would i would say very unlikely in in most cases but i can't rule that kind of stuff out so you said you were getting out of your body sometimes four or five times a week. Have you figured out a way that you can do it at will whenever you want to? No, because, well, there's people who make that claim. You know, there's, there's a couple of authors who say that they can at will leave their bodies. And sometimes I'm a little bit of a show me the evidence kind of guy. So it's like, well, if that's the case, can you leave your, you know, like let's, let's set up some tests or something. Right. Mm-hmm. Because in, rea- in real life, it's really difficult to do that type of thing because it's so unpredictable. So even if you have a test or something set up that you want to do, and I have done those things, I've actually passed them, but it's it's really difficult because, like you know, you might be you might have had a bunch of out of body experiences, and then you you know you're like, okay, tonight I'm when it happens, I'm gonna do this and that, but then your experience is like number one, like you don't have the experience you wanted to have, and then number two, like when it happens, you're not in out of the out of your body in your bedroom, like you're in a whole different environment, and. So it'd be really interesting if there really was somebody who could leave at will, because then you could maybe test it scientifically. So um, I'd, I'd like to talk to whoever that person might be, but it seems it seems very, I mean, I guess certain yogis, you know, like a yogi master, they might have expanded their consciousness through like a generation or decades of training mm-hmm. to the point where it actually is possible to just have complete control of like, your astral consciousness, whatever you want to call it, just go anywhere you want, anytime you want, any place you want. And uh, I, I don't really doubt that. I mean, they, they train in temples and that's, that's their whole life is to be able to do things like that. So it, I, I think in that context, it is possible. Now, you mentioned that you met this Indian couple. Have you seen any other entities while you're out traveling or met any other beings? Well, yeah, um, that's part of the whole process is, you, you know, you try to meet people in that in that state of in in in, the, in a different plane of existence and uh, well at least the way i do it is that that's my main focus so some people do the out of body stuff because they want to gain powers they want to become like dr dr strange or something um but that, that to me is a lot less interesting than having experiences with real people that are living in a different plane of existence mm-hmm. because that's kind of where at least to me, the meaning comes out of it from. So uh, to answer your question, um, I would say 
a boring experience as if I'm just out of my body or in some environment by myself. And that is happens a lot of the time, especially like my, the parallel kind of house I usually appear in, but a experience that I'll like really like, like come out of and like take note in my journal and maybe, maybe even talk about like on, on my, on my show or something is when I, I was able to meet and connect with a real person who I could verify, like was a real person. Uh, and even in some rare cases, like, find out who they were in this world and be able to verify it or even find out if there was somebody from this world who, who had died and like finding the proof that they had died or finding their obituary or something like that. And um, so that, that's, a, I mean, so yeah, having experiences with other souls is for me, the primary goal. Oh, that's really interesting. Can you give us an example of someone that you found and then you went and found their obituary? Yeah. Um, so what happened, the more recent one, I wrote about this on my website, the whole article, but it's like, um, let's see. So there was, this was back in 2019. I was actually in, where was I? I was in Vienna. Yeah, I was in Vienna but when I was traveling in Europe in a hostel. So as usual, I don't really control when I have an experience. So I'm lying down to sleep and then I have begin having this experience with a with a guy that I meet who um, I could tell he was actually shifting form. So I found this odd because one moment he looked like a particular type of person. And then he was wearing like a toga and he looked uh, Roman or Greek. And so he was kind of shifting his appearance and we were chatting and we started jogging along a path, you know, while he was telling me about himself and he was basically describing that he had a past life in uh, ancient Greece, and uh, I think it was Athens. And uh, so this was his like main primary past life and he had the ability to go between his past lives where he is now, kind of like switching between characters, so to speak, right? So if he had all his lives, he could, you know, become whoever he wanted. And then he said his like most recent life, uh, kind of, I guess, going into tradition of having been a warrior, like in Greece, he was a soldier and the, I'm trying to remember if it was the Marine Corps or the army it might have been the Marine Corps here in uh, the USA. And then he told me that he died in combat in Afghanistan. And so now I'm lucid enough like that I can be like, okay, I got to get some info about this for like my work. So I'm like, okay, please try to, you know, give me, the, give me your name and your date of birth and whatever I can. So I can like look you up. And so he did. And then sure enough, not long after that, like, I think some kids came into the hostel and woke me up. It's like so frustrating, but I got the info and like, I jumped up, got on the laptop, put it in, did, did a bunch of research and actually found that name and date of birth in a list of uh, people who are casualties, people who have passed away in a particular uh, year in Afghanistan. So I considered that a hit. I mean, could that be a coincidence? Yes, but I don't think it's very likely. So like, to me, that was a good verification. Do you feel like that the people you meet are, you know, earth people that have passed and they're just out of their body in whatever realm is out there? Or do you even meet non-human entities that are from other realms? Um, yeah, you can meet both. I mean, that is the way the multiverse is constructed outside of this planet is you have a lot of people from different realms, ETs, humans. I mean, it's all just, it's this crazy party going on outside of this world. I mean, that's not happening here, at least not consciously. There may, there may be other dimensional beings walking around that we don't realize what that that's what they are. But, you know, on that side, it's pretty apparent. I mean, generally, if you walk into a, the astral town square, I mean, you'll see humans, but if you saw a big gray alien walking around, it would be perfectly normal. You know, it wouldn't right. be weird at all. Um, or even an entity that's non-human, but is um, interacting as a human, or you can tell there's something about that entity that doesn't look like, you know, it's one of us. So it could be like, I remember I had an experience with a couple of women who you could describe like, like almost like succubus. So they had, mm. you know, they had like hooves for feet. Wow. And uh, that that's just like one example. All right. So it sounds like to me that you're not willfully getting out of your body. It just kind of happens. So out of all the times that it's happened, have you sat around and considered, okay, is there some kind of common denominator that's having you do this? Like yeah, exhaustion actually, be, or something? Mm -hmm, now you actually, you actually, you actually um, possibly nailed it a little bit. So it's not completely random because 
there's a physical mechanism involved. It seems to involve when your body is deactivated. So for example, sleep paralysis is one of them. The, the point is to have conscious control of what we would call the astral body, which is basically the ghost body. So what is the, what, what is the body of, a, of an entity that's in someone's, someone's attic, you know, rattling pots and pans around? Well, that, that would be a, a, a soul operating in the higher spectrum energy, energetic body known as the astral body. So if your physical body is shut down or paralyzed, you actually gain like automatic control of that, of the astral body and you can start moving it around and then potentially like pull yourself out of your body. So for me, what happens, especially if I'm, if I am exhausted or if I'm disrupting my sleep pattern. So let's say I usually go to sleep at 12 AM and I wake up at like 8 30 AM or 1 AM and I wake up at nine, whatever it might be. If I mix it up and I get less sleep the night before, and I take a nap at like 12 PM uh, half the time I'll, I'll go out of body. And if I'll know that's happening because I'll lie down to take a nap and like an hour into it, instead of sleeping, I'll start feeling all this energetic weirdness happening. And then I'll know I'm leaving my body. Then for me, I immediately I'll try to leave the body. So like, there's no fear involved. I'm like, okay, good. I'm having an out of body experience. I just immediately jump into it and then like pull myself out of my body. And then that can lead into an astral experience or just a normal out of body experience floating around. Um, so that's a big factor is, is actually, uh, a sleep cycle and uh, for other people, it's other variables, right? So it's, it can be a very personal thing about, you know, depending on a lot of different factors about, you know, what, what can make someone have experiences a lot. And sometimes it is random, or sometimes it maybe is being facilitated by some other entity that is like pulling you out of your body because it wants to talk to you or something along those lines. Those, those types of things can happen as well. Do you think someone can really teach someone to have an out of body experience or that's not true? No, I mean, that's, well, I mean, not to like self promote, but that is what I do. Right. So one, mm -hmm. one of the things that I do is I teach people astral projection and a lot of the, my uh, clients have been people who have lost loved ones. And that's a big motivator because they want to see their loved one. Again, they want to use that as a way to connect to someone who's passed away. And so I think that's a bigger motivator than someone who just wants to do it for fun. So some of the people that I've talked to who have lost loved ones, they want to learn how to do it, you know, doing some of these principles, including disrupting the sleep, sleep, sleep cycle, uh, but uh, a, lot, a lot of other little techniques and methods and ideas to try out. But it's kind of like if you get it into a rhythm and you get into a, a schedule and you stay committed to it and you have someone kind of holding you accountable to keep trying this again and again. I've had some people who, you know, they never had an experience before and now they're having experiences every week and like crazy stuff that even like co competes against my own experiences. Like for having wow. gone from a point of not ever having an experience to being like, telling me like this crazy story that happened to them involving being on like a different plane of existence and meeting people and uh, all kinds of, all kinds of wild stuff. So it's definitely teachable, but also some people have a real difficult time. So some people are, um, they, they either have a block in place, like some kind of mental block, or there's some factor that is difficult to understand or determine where, for some people, it's just, you know, it, like it, it either never happens or it's a much longer process to get to the point of having an experience. Do you think one of the major blocks is fear? Yeah, probably the number one block is fear. And the number two block, I would say, is an indeterminate level of, um, how do I describe this, kind of like um, being mentally closed off to having experiences beyond the body. We could almost say that it's when, when someone is very psychically tethered into this body. Mm. So the sometimes factors uh, can even be related to diet or stress or um, some kind of a deep like bias against this. Like even if you caught you consciously on, on, on your conscious mind, like, oh, I love this material. I love this idea. I want to have an experience. But more subconsciously, you've been raised by perhaps people who ridic ridiculed supernatural ideas or any other number of issues like that. And you have this, like, like it's almost like you've closed yourself off to it. Mm -hmm. I notice a lot of the people like that have a commonality. So they don't, they don't have many dreams either. So if someone has a lot of like an active dreaming life, they're either already going out of their body, they don't realize it, or it's going to be easy for them to start having experiences. When someone's never dreaming, 
that means there's some kind of a psychic block happening. How do you teach somebody or how do you help somebody to get over that fear? So for the fear part, um, well, like I said, if someone's trying to connect with a loved one, then you want that desire to connect to be stronger than being afraid of leaving the body. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's going to usually happen if, if, if that's the motivation. If, if that's not the motivation, then you have to, well, best thing to do is start to have an experience. And as long as nothing negative happens during the experience, then you'll kind of be over the fear. Right. So if you can have the experience and you're all right, then subsequent experiences won't be so challenging to have. But unfortunately, you can't like make someone not be afraid the first time. And you do have to be afraid the first time and then just work through it and then still be motivated to want to keep having the experiences after. Mm -hmm. Uh, Education can help. So learning about the process and learning what happens, where you go, what's involved with it, what can happen, how to not be affected by like negative entities should you encounter one. And uh, learning all of these like esoteric principles, or I don't even want to say esoteric principles because I, I really, it's more of a scientific matter. It's just uh, not fully understood yet, but I, I would say just learning metaphysical principles, you know, mm-hmm. we'll go with that. Uh, I think that can reduce fear a lot as opposed to just being like com- in, in, in completely unknown. All right. What advice do you have if you do happen to encounter negative entities? Yeah, I mean, you just know know the way that the know the way the game is played, which is based upon consent. So, if you don't give something consent, you don't let the vampire in the door, you know, through the door. And that that's an old fable for a reason, because that is the way the game is played. So, um, they trick you into giving you their consent, and then if you know the way the game is played, you can actually just laugh at them because you'll know that they can't do anything. You know, mm-hmm. I've had negative entities try to say bow before me. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, so if I bow before you, then I'm submitting to you. And then you can walk all over me and do whatever you want, get into my home and, and try to make me into a slave. I'm like, I see how it's going. No, have a nice day. You know, and then they're completely helpless. They can, they can't do anything. <laughs> they're, 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 uh, you know, they, they just, you know, they, they just lost their day at work or whatever. <laughs> Out of all these experiences, have you had one or a few that just completely freaked you out or just something that happened to you that you just kept thinking about it for days and couldn't shake it? Yeah. I mean, there's been quite a few. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm hesitant to bring this up because it gets controversial, but I, I guess I will because I, I actually did talk about it in my first book. And so mm-hmm. it, the cat is, the cat is out of the bag. All right. Uh, and I, that book came out years ago, but there was the um, experience where I had a guy who was uh kind of a colleague and also out of body teacher and, and, um, and such. And he, 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 he cooked up this great idea once that he was going to contact, uh, the, the, you know, the, the great occultist, Alistair Crowley, because mm-hmm. he's always pushing himself. Right. He's like, Oh, I want to like, <laughs> now I want to, I want to learn from Alistair Crowley. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you yeah, know, I don't know, man. It's like, doesn't seem like a great idea to me. And, uh, so, so he was trying to contact, Crowley and I was sort of talking him out of it. And uh, so that was kind of it. I, I didn't actually know that much about Crowley. So I was doing some research on him. Right. So, I mean, just like Wikipedia articles, things like this, trying to see if there was like some positive elements of being involved in, in that level of, 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 I guess you could call it left hand path teachings or whatever. Anyway, um, so I went to bed that night and I started having like some strange dreams that were turning astral or lucid very fast. And this is, I was living in Los Angeles at the time and I was aware that I was sort of into Hollywood Hills, but on the other side, you know, the other Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I was at this big mansion and I was like something brought me to this mansion. Now I was getting lucid and aware. And so like I walked into this mansion and this woman came out to meet me and she had black hair. And I, and I know very much, you know, I can remember very well what she looked like. And she said, um, Mr. Crowley was aware that you were researching him and what your friend was trying to do. And he was very interested in your work and he would like to have an audience with you. So, so I said, okay. 
And she said, right this way, and I'll um and I'll uh I'll present you to Mr. Crowley. So I followed her, you know, down this mansion. And then that experience ended, and suddenly I was back in my body, but I was out of my body. So like I was being pulled out of my body, basically like an invisible hand was dragging me, like my astral body out of my body in my bedroom, and I was being pulled up by like I would say like maybe six feet above my body. And I saw from the corner of my eye, there was like this black vortex or swirling thing kind of gathering in my room. And now I was just like, I was just like floating there out of my body watching that happen. And then like this British voice kicked in and it was identifying as, as Alistair Crowley. So then I began like having a conversation with, you know, the entity calling itself Alistair Crowley. And that lasted about 20 minutes. And we had a long conversation about a bunch of topics, you know, kind of like we're talking now. Mm-hmm. And eventually, you know, it, it, it winded down. And um, I mean, if, if we had more time, I could get into like what the stuff we talked about, but some philosophical concepts concerning mm-hmm. like the ethics of teaching people about the beyond and other dimensions and life after death, because he was basically going on about how he thought it was important kind of to keep people ignorant about all these subjects because it's part of like the personal growth process of the individual not to know about, let's say, let's say life after death, for example, Mm -hmm. people go around thinking that they're going to die and then they're going to get snuffed out. Then this, this creates certain qualities after you die, which are, you know, very useful. Like people will go think back, like they'll be grateful that they had so much ignorance when they were on earth. And it's better to make Earth, basically, almost like his thesis was Earth should be as miserable of a planet as possible, because that's going to make the ideal conditions for people when they cross over. And part of me also, I mean, I kind of thought, like, I I get what he's saying, and that logically makes sense, but I can't help but think also keeping people ignorant and miserable is a great way to control them, too, right? So uh, that... You know, it's why I kind of had a disagreement with him. But um, ultimately, though, uh, we got along very well. Mm -hmm. And so that experience ended. And then I did some more research. I found a picture of Crowley's wife. Her name was like like Maria de Miramar or something like that. Anyway, I immediately recognized like that's the woman I saw in the dream or the the kind of projection slash dream part of that experience. Like Mm -hmm. I saw that woman. That was that was who led me through the mansion. So that was in terms of experiences that you don't stop thinking about. Well, I still think about that one quite often and not because I'm starstruck by Crowley. I mean, it's just that, you know, the way all this kind of stuff comes together, that you can be researching somebody and not even knowing that you're sending a message out to them and then being having a contact experience by like a higher level type of entity. And he's higher level, but also on the, also a little bit on the negative spectrum. And, you know, preferably you can have, probably you want to have experiences with guides and angelic beings and things like that. You don't want to follow my lead and have an experience like that. <laughs> but um, because it was so unusual, though, it really, you know, was something that I've thought about a lot. So I'll take it back to you. Well, you said your friend was more interested, I think, in encountering with him. Did he encounter Alistair Crowley as well? <laughs> it's so funny you mentioned that because I forgot. So so here, here's what happens. So I get the experience with Crowley coming to me. Mm-hmm. My friend was actively leaving his body and trying to find him. So after I had this experience and I didn't tell him about my experience, he's like, hey, Cyrus, yeah, it, it was really ridiculous. I, I did get into what it was like, a, a waiting room so there was all these people waiting to try to meet with crowley and there were like bouncers and like security and all the people around me were complete losers <laughs> and they you know they're they just a bunch of idiots i didn't want to be around them so i just gave up so after you've done all this stuff what in your opinion is consciousness what's going on with your consciousness leaving your body do you have you formulated like your own theories about that kind of stuff I actually think, and it's a bit controversial, I, I kind of feel like consciousness creates biology to represent it. Mm-hmm. And I would not be surprised at all if, well, in some ways I've uh, verified it personally, but we have a brain here that's translating consciousness 
the concept of the brain or the mechanism of the brain, I think exists on all these different dimensional levels. So I don't actually think that it's like you live here and you're in this nuts and bolts physical body and then you die and then you're an orb of light who's like free of all physical type of representation. You're just, you know, you're just a, you, you, you're just, just, just pure energy, for example. Although I think that can happen to some people and maybe that's even a superior mode of, um, of existence from certain levels. It seems like uh, no matter what level you're on, like it keeps like your consciousness keeps creating a biological representation. So th- there's a brain here and then you can, you can leave your body and potentially have a brain on that side. And you certainly have a body and you certainly, you know, you can, you can still prick yourself and bleed. And uh, so presumably there's an organ system. And then when you're, you know, you have all these psychic abilities that you don't have here, telepathy and uh, conjuration, teleportation, all these, you know, these higher density powers. But I feel like there's still some kind of a component that's filtering consciousness through mm-hmm. or regulating, regulating consciousness so that you can interact in an environment instead of just being like uh, a pure energy being that actually doesn't have an ability to integrate into the physical environment. So I, I feel like I feel like biology is is always being generated by consciousness, which is ultimately has power over everything. Mm. And so we're not dependent on our biology, but when we are conscious souls, we're, we're creating these uh, mechanisms to be able to interact in whatever environment it may be. And that includes the brain. So we're really dependent on the brain in this plane of existence. And if we switch into a different plane of existence, then we might have a different brain activated that's that's kind of doing the same process again. And we might be kind of dependent still on it, but I think we have a much more freedom. And uh, maybe if you get up high enough and there is no biological process anymore, but it's just that, that that is, I guess, my pet theory is that there are biological processes in different densities, different vibratory realms of existence that are always kind of playing out or being represent or rep- representing our like divine consciousness. So that's why it's not it's not such a black and white subject of like either which we would call uh, dualism, right? So dualism is this really black and white philosophy of you you're either physical matter or you are without matter and you're a pure spirit being, and it doesn't leave a lot of room for other things. And you you hear about dualism a lot, for example, in near death studies. If we go more into idealism or panpsychism, then everything is conscious. And so even the physical matter stuff is also consciousness generating all of it. Mm-hmm. So I, we're getting a little complicated, I guess. But I guess in, in a nutshell, what we're looking at is from my view is everything is being generated by consciousness. So you can't. So even the brain, it's not like this is the physical meat stuff. And then that doesn't matter anymore once you're dead or you're out of your body. It's more like what's what's consciousness going to make next you know is it going to make another brain that we can you know use to interact somewhere or a different body or can we then sh- shape shift into any body we want because once 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 our consciousness has more power to do things like that and theoretically you could look like anything be anything you want be in any kind of body you want all these types of things or create anything you want uh conjuration create objects create uh, food, create, create, a, create a building, create a house. Mm. And what we learn from these studies is that is indeed what you're able to do as you move up into different, um, diff- different, different levels, if that makes sense. So I'll, I'll take it back to you. You know, I, I think it's great what you're saying. I used to be more of a dualist. Sometimes I still am, but I was kind of on the theory that, you know, your consciousness is like the cloud and your brain is like your computer, just kind of catching that signal. But I had a podcast with Dr. Bernardo Castrop. I don't know if you know him. Mm-hmm. And from my interpretation of what he says is just in this realm, your body is your manifestation of your consciousness. And I guess, and it's almost kind of just like what you're saying in another realm, you're just going to manifest some other body and some other, you know, brain and everything. And I mean, it's, it's remarkable what the brain can do as a manifestation of consciousness, but it's a tool, I think, because 
I think most people, let, let's say I've had a 500 different lives, different fractals of, you know, as Silver Birch would say, of the diamond. So, you know, you have one oversoul and all these little parts of it spinning off and making lives or reincarnating. To, for me to have a life here, you know, I can't have access to all those memories. You know, I need, I need, I need a mechanism to filter my conscious. Every, everything needs to go through a filter mm. or else um, it just won't be a proper experience. You know, if I had all memory of all my lives, I mean, I'd be walking around as some kind of higher oversoul super being, and that's awesome. <laughs> but it would completely defeat the purpose of having an existence mm. here. Not, not to say that it was all intelligently created either. I almost, I also do, of course, the, I believe in like evolution. I think that you know organisms got more and more sophisticated, and brains became more and more sophisticated. But that's the system that's in place. <clears throat> that we're adapted to. And you can access the cloud, so to speak, and get those memories back. But you got to have a brain that's being able to filter and reduce all this stuff that represents a much, much, you know, if, if you're only you be 1% of the bigger version of, of what you are without the brain reducing that down. Well, I don't even think it would work. I don't, I don't think all that info would even be able to be contained in the physical body. So um, it's just like, it, it's just the way it has to be. And so it, you know, so we are really, really dependent on the brain because of those reasons. But if your brain shuts off, though, it doesn't even matter. You immediately switch over to either a new brain or you, uh, ast your astral body, whatever the case might be. And it's uh, that's, uh, that's an instantaneous process. So even if right now it seems like, you know, we're completely dependent on this thing. And then that can lead to the belief that if it shuts down, we shut down. But we know that's not the case. Terminal lucidity is a great example of that. People uh, have Alzheimer's and they're within hours of death and all their memories come back and their personalities come back and everything comes back and they get to hang out with their friends and loved ones before they pass. That's because that auxiliary system just turned itself back on. Hmm. So it's very, um, it's, it's a, like we're really dependent on it, but until we're not. And then, and then we then we don't, but then, then we're not stuck with this thing anymore. So when somebody is astral traveling or leaving their body, some of their consciousness is still here because it's or their body wouldn't exist anymore. But then I guess a piece of your consciousness is also going somewhere else. So how do you explain that? Yeah, it's only a piece. So the the um, the level of out of body experience depends upon how much you're able to separate out compared to your mind still being tethered here. So a dream, for example, might, might be information coming in from that side, but you're completely tethered to your brain, so you can't even get new information. So everything has to go through the existing like, like memory bank in your brain about what, what you know. So to clarify what that means, if you have a dream, you, if you dream that you're in Mexico and you don't speak any Spanish and someone's trying to speak to you in Spanish, then you'll remember from the dream a bunch of gibberish because you don't know any Spanish. And so whatever they say is just going to be, um, you know, if all you can say is buenos noches or something, then that's all you'll be able to remember because that's all you know. Hmm. If you're having a really proper out-of-body or astral projection experience and you meet someone who is uh, Spanish or Hispanic and they, they speak to you, you'll be able to remember what they said and look up in the dictionary the words you have never heard before because you're properly disconnected from your body and you're properly enough of you is on that side and you can get the information back. So there is a spectrum there. And that's just one example, but that's in essence kind of how it is. Mm -hmm. So um, you can't be completely over there, I think, unless you're dead. Um, but you can get enough of you over there. You know, you can get enough of like, you, you can fill enough of the, the pitcher of water if that's your consciousness. You can pour enough of it in the glass that you can have a, have an experience on that side that that is, you know, part of you really being there, but you won't be fully over there until you're dead. Why do you think so much uh, near death experiencers experience so much extreme bliss and joy and happiness over there? Because there's a contrast with this world where you don't feel hardly any of that you experience that for the first time and it's like you know a completely different type of existence and that's especially if you're in what we call the higher astral plane of existence so it's kind of like you know you've never felt that because there's so much contrast between like the 
really like the vibratory level of this world almost being the opposite of bliss and joy unless maybe you're like a little kid running around but it's so thick and murky and kind of vile in this plane of existence that you don't even realize that that, that it feels that way until you're no longer in that condition anymore mm. so once you once you get away from the thick grimy nasty existence that is the uh, earth plane which some people I've talked to astrally have described as hell <laughs> which is where we are right now then you like I can't believe I was swimming in that in that garbage my entire life and I think that's why they describe it as all that's unimaginable bliss and all that I think it's almost an exaggeration in the sense because they they're not used to that I mean if I think if they were living on that side for a long time they would kind of adjust to that and then just, just just be happier and higher energy and feeling grateful that they're there because I don't think people just live in like perpetual drug trip, you know, <laughs> yeah. 24 hours a day on that side. And some people want that. And I think that that could be a little bit of a deception because you don't, you know, you want to progress in life and you want to, you want to keep evolving and having experiences that are both good and bad. And you can definitely do that on that side. But the people who, have read like very very short experiences with the afterlife from near death experiences and basically what they say is i can't wait to die so i can just be in a 24 hour perpetual drug trip you know all constantly just in bliss 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 mm -hmm. bliss blissed out i think they don't i think they don't quite get it mm -hmm. because one you don't actually want to do that because it's going to just like well if you were on a drug trip here I, your life would your life would be over Right. You want to be able to progress and have experiences and get challenged and stuff like that. So I think it's important for people not to take near-death experience quite so literally like that when someone is trying to just express like how, how much joy they felt being away from here. Mm. So that's kind of the way I look at it. There's also experiences with like higher self or source consciousness. There's people who arrive on that side who are so battered and broken mentally that they need like an infusion of the light and love or whatever so that they can get become active again and become um you know become fully functional mm -hmm. so sometimes that happens to people but there's a lot of near death experiences where they you know they're just just I had a guy on my show recently where they're on that side and like they're in a city and they're being given a tour and they're you know uh, there's people working jobs and having existences there so it's not just floating around on a drug trip but mm -hmm. I'll get off my soapbox and turn no, it back to you I think it's great so what do you think is the point to this life? Why do we come here? What are we doing here? I mean, I think it's, there's a number of, there's always a macro perspective, you know, in the ma highest macro perspective, there's all the philosophy about ascending from, you know, a tiny speck of consciousness into like some becoming closer and closer back to source and all these types of things. But if you go, if you zoom in a little bit, you can kind of see, I mean, almost just using, lo using logical principles that we are in a physical system. Um, we do get lives here. It might be by choice. It also might not be by choice. We do know that we learn a lot and go through a lot of trials and tribulations here. I also believe that it's like you gain a level of access to what we call like the astral domain of the human soul. So obviously there's infinite extraterrestrial types of civilizations, societies, soul groups, and whatever you are before you're born, maybe before you're born, you're like a little speck of light floating around on some higher plane, you know, you, you just imagining like what kind of soul group am I going to join? You know, what culture, what society am I going to become part of? And, you know, it's like, let, let's say you want to become a human. Well, if you want to let, you know, let, let, let's say the astral human civilization is way better than here. And, you know, it's all these amazing things. You got all, all the amazing stuff about this world without all the drawbacks and that's kind of what you want to do. But to get there, you have to first get born here and, and form the physical body. And then from there on, you might form into the astral body. But you have to you have to start at the beginning by coming to Earth and basically building a character, building a life here. And so you go through the, the tough process of the Earth plane. And then you can graduate from the earth plane into like the next level above that. And now you have, now you're karmically tied to the human experience and you have a human body and you have human relationships and you're part of the human culture. And uh, so you've come a long way from being a little orb of light. Mm -hmm. And so there's probably many, many reasons or variables why a particular soul would want to go through all this. 
Uh, I think that probably every single person is its own unique story about like, why did you, why were you drawn to the humans, the human soul group? Why didn't you become a Arcturian or something? Mm -hmm. But I don't know. You'd have to ask each person, huh? Yeah. All right. So you have a YouTube channel. What is the name of your channel and what kind of content do you post there? Okay, so the channel is Afterlife Topics and Metaphysics. A lot of times it's me lecturing, talking about my experiences, astral experiences I've had, spirit communication experiences I've had. Uh, there's a lot of guests and in, guest interviews, the same as your channel, and mm -hmm. those have those go back a ways. Uh, interesting stuff, stuff that also it can be on, on a broader paranormal level, but also like uh, spirit images, mm -hmm. uh, EVP and ITC types of things. And uh, as well as sometimes uh, occasionally like an invest investigative video. I'm going to try to do some more of those. Mm -hmm. So that's the YouTube channel. Then there's the Facebook group of the same name, Afterlife Topics and Metaphysics, which uh, has been going on for a long time. A lot of people sharing stories and things like that. And of course, the books. And first book was Understanding Life After Death, and that book uh, that was 2015. But it was, I think, it's a good objective evidence-based approach to uh, knowing that there's more to our lives than just this one. That's that's my main message. I I try to get out, mm. and then trying to get some tangible ideas about it as well. Because if you don't go a little bit tangible, then we go into like. Two, two extreme levels of dualism like we talked about yeah. where sometimes that's not a whole lot better than like the conventions of materialism right because it's like yeah there might be an afterlife or a spirit type of situation but um you just rejoin the cloud you know <laughs> and you're no longer you you no longer have an identity like but i don't think that that doesn't match up with the evidence and so education i think is also a big part of all of this as well so um, so those are a few directions to go, but, um, do you have any, any more questions or a lightning round? I'm happy to, I'm happy to take them. <laughs> well, I just recently discovered that Carl Jung had near death experience. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I did actually talk, I believe I talked specifically about that in, um, maybe it was my second book. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but I can't like recall the whole experience off the top of my head. But, like, mm -hmm. like I, I believe was the heart attack or something, something I don't. Remember yeah. all the details. I researched it a while back, but I know um, it influenced a lot of his work. And he was of kind of butting heads with Freud, who was more of a materialist. But Jung was very aware of a lot of these subjects. And it's why Jung is, I think, still a really important um, person in all these uh, in all these fields. Mm -hmm. All right. So how many books do you have out? Two? Uh, so it's understanding life after death, uh, the afterlife and beyond. I co-wrote or produced a book called Awakened by Death, and that mm -hmm. has a lots of co a collection of stories. Mm -hmm. And there's other books floating around which are of unrelated subjects, but this is my main my main uh, focus these days. And uh, probably hopefully a fourth book at some point soon. And do you have any other things that you're working on that you want us to know about? Well, let's see. Uh, besides a potential fourth book which is going to take a while that's still unfolding um i guess the, the main thing that i'm working on is um well yeah i'm working on that book i'm working on growing expanding the community which is on youtube as well as facebook and some new platforms like i, I want to get something set up on discord probably mm -hmm. and i guess that's it for now it's just about trying to get that next book out and hopefully that'll happen around a quarter again that's the main the website is afterlifetopics.com so that is where i post updates about that kind of stuff if you met somebody who had a near-death experience let's say last week and they're not they're having trouble processing it what kind of advice would you give them well i would say uh read a lot of other people's near-death experiences i'm sure they're doing that already but mm -hmm. Um, that's a good way not to feel alone. I think someone who has a really tough time processing it is because they feel like if they feel, feel really alone because they, they, they're thrown into this world without, you know, without a life raft. So uh, reading many other people's experiences and also uh, going kind of the intersectional approach. So looking at other types of experiences and mm -hmm. learning about the afterlife more uh, and continuing on, you know, into like, the rabbit hole i think i think that's pretty important instead of just like kind of uh thinking about your experience not not knowing how to relate to it so you want to talk to other people as well and you want to you want to get involved in communities but 
Also keep your keep your marbles though, because sometimes the communities, you know, you, you can get people because in near death experiences can be so different, you know. So you can have somebody who has an NDE, and maybe they maybe it made them really into like a hardcore religious fundamentalist because they had like an experience with like a hollow heaven or something that set them up to believe even more in something like that. So you, you have to be careful because some of those groups they can have people who are like really going into some kind of like, like an aggressive or ideological frame of mind but if you can find like a level-headed group of people then that that would be good i have quite a few experiencers that encounter jesus do you have an opinion on why so many people encounter jesus one of two things uh well the main thing is that if someone's very christian and then they are going through the dying process they will not ex- they will reject any experience that that jesus if jesus is not there they'll say this is of the devil and i reject it and that can be dangerous if you're about to die or you are dying because you could end up as an earthbound spirit, right? Because you're just going to reject everything. And uh, there's a whole administration on that side that, that I mean, their whole duty is to try to keep people from ending up as earthbound or ending up in these, these, these terrible situations. So you either have to dress up as Jesus and help bring them into the environment, or maybe Jesus actually will appear. Because Jesus, being multidimensional, could theoretically be in hundreds of places at once, just like Santa Claus. Um, so I think one of those two things is happening. But if it doesn't happen like that, then it's going to be a big problem if, if, if a Christian passes away and they're not being met by Jesus. If that's what they expect, it's the only thing that they'll accept. And um, it's necessary or else, or else it, you know, it, it would be really bad. What about the atheists that happen to meet Jesus? That's a weird one, you know. It almost makes me wonder if it's not an almost ideological thing on that side because they're like, well, you know, wouldn't it be, let's really show this atheist, um, you know, if we, maybe we can convert him into Christianity when he comes back to his body because we'll, <laughs> we'll come in and dress up as Jesus and then um, it'll bring more people into our into the fold. So it's weird to conceptualize like spirits, you know, higher dimensional beings plotting, <laughs> but. <laughs> We can't dismiss that as a possibility. I, I there's one important point I would even tell viewers: never venerate the other side. Not even a higher being. Always keep your sovereignty. Never let any being tell you what to do. Say you have to reincarnate. You have to join this movement or join this religion or bow before me because I am a higher spirit or an angel. I am your authority. Now, all of that, none of that exists. All of that goes against basic cosmic laws of uh, individual sovereignty and equality. Mm-hmm. So a um, lot of higher beings and spirit, spiritual beings and spirit guides, look, they all have, both of them are on a higher vibration and they're very positive. But there can also be agendas. There can be uh, almost like political factions and crazy stuff that you won't hear about in a conventional near death experience. So never, never venerate anyone from that side. That is, that is my main advice. That's very fascinating because you wouldn't think, you know, any of that stuff would be going on. You just think you're going, you know, to heaven and angels and everything's. And that's the and weakness that, that that's where you could end up in trouble because you just think, you know, everything from here on out, I will follow anything anyone tells me to do because I, you know, I am now at the gates of heaven and this is God. And it's not that big of a deal. You know, you can die and your, you, your experience could be on astral sofa eating astral Cheetos. I like to joke about that. You won't, this is, it doesn't necessarily being, you know, in this highly exalted realm and either experience is just as valuable. So if you're in an exalted, extremely like a high level type of realm, the best thing you can do is treat any, any entity that you meet as, as your equal and uh, never, never take what they say as quote, holy or religious or as gospel, because if they present it that way, there's a chance that something wants to manipulate it. There's a chance it's, it's a, it's a religious group soul that has some kind of agenda in place. And you don't want to become a pawn for that. You don't want to get stuck into a reincarnation trap or anything like that. So it's just, I think it's, I think it's very important. People always view all souls and every plane of existence as equals, never something up there. You have to like, follow follow or obey that's the weakness of humanity it's why entities and things want to exploit this particular planet it's something we have to fight back against what about people who say they've met god or if they call you know meeting god source do you think that they're meeting actually god or the source of all creation it could be or it might not be so source consciousness it seems to be an accessible state of consciousness where 
you've zoomed so far out that you gain sudden awareness of all that is. And I think some people have that experience and it's authentic. And uh, I've never had that experience, but I've certainly researched and I'm aware of people who do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a higher dimensional being has the ability even to pull someone out to experience source consciousness. But there could also be a higher dimensional being that says, I am God. And if you, especially if it's an anthropomorphic entity, you'll know it's probably BS. Mm. So it'll just be something that's like pure energy then, if it's real, you think? Well, not even that. It would be like uh, almost like a manifestation of everything that is. It would be so higher dimensional. It would be very difficult to probably put into words, just like the people who really do experience that. Mm -hmm. But it's also, you'll know it's very, it's like, accessible on an like you'll know it's accessible from an inner level mm -hmm. you know it's like the, the metaphors is often like you're a drop of water falling in the ocean and uh for a moment you're communicating with the entire ocean mm -hmm. so you but you you know you're still the drop of water but you're having a conversation with the entire ocean for a moment and then you come back to being a drop of water again that's often how people describe it Okay, yeah, because I was going to say, some people will say that they experience that they're one with everything. And I, well, are you saying that they feel like, you know, they are the tree, they are the earth, they are the, the sun, or but they're still sovereign? Like yeah, I mean, that that's the nature of, yeah, that that is like the higher spiritual experience or the higher level of transcendental experience that people can happen in this world or it can, or you can get thrown into that experience um, when you're out of your body or you're having a, you know, a higher, you know, like a higher level divine communication type of thing. And, uh, or you could even, you know, a certain beings, certain people, even in this world, like they, they just operate on that level mm -hmm. and they have a level of like, ex like, you know, they have that kind of bliss as they just go through life because they're interconnected with everything around them, but you still have to keep the individuality or else what's the point. So there has to be that in between type of balance that I, I talk about that on my channel, the nine spheres of consciousness. So there's, there has to be this place in between individual and unity or else you can just go back to the unity, but then you're just God. And then God wanted to become an individual entity. So you might as well do what you originally set out to do. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right, Cyrus, this has been an amazing conversation. I'm really glad that I had you on. Um, so besides writing books, what else do you do? And your Oh YouTube. gosh, I used to do a lot of traveling before the pandemic. So I have a little travel channel called Cyrus the Explorer just for fun, but I, I was all over the place and I really enjoy just, you know, being able to have adventure or not know like who, what, who ser serendipity will bring into your life and, uh, <clears throat> exploring and things like that. And now I'm kind of stuck back in my hometown here and, uh, still recovering. I had COVID and. My body has been a mess for about 14 months. Wow. So I'm just trying to get better, wait until the world is better, save some money, hopefully get back to kind of living a more nomadic lifestyle. You know, maybe a little spiritual nomad, right? You know, like mm -hmm. I, I, I talk about my subjects, I wander around or meet people and, uh, you know, just kind of follow that follow that uh, lifestyle kind of, you know, that, that, that's what I really like to do. But mm -hmm. hopefully, in a, maybe in seven or eight months, I'll be able to get back to it. I wanted to ask this earlier, and I'm just going to ask it now anyways. I'm just curious. Have you ever done any psychedelics like DMT or ayahuasca, especially since you're a traveler? And if so, how would you compare that to astral traveling? You know, it's fine. To be perfectly honest, um, I've taken... I, I've taken uh, some like mushrooms and mm. notice like I, I have I, i'm really like i have some kind of block when it comes to that type of thing like i mm. can't get an experience from it even 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 like normal marijuana it's like mm. everyone else could be having a good time and it's like mm. it's something that just kind of blocks me and then the harder stuff i have never done you know mm. so if, if asking like um dmt or something like that i I um I don't I don't I don't, I don't do that stuff. Uh, something to, uh, intuitively, I have a feeling like I shouldn't, mm -hmm. but maybe I will eventually. But if I did, I'd probably begin with peyote in mm -hmm. small amounts and see how that enhances me or where that might take me. But a lot of those substances do take you inner in, into into your inner worlds. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think if you astral travel, you're going into outer world, outer like the external worlds beyond you, and 
And I probably, there's a lot to be learned if I went into the inner worlds, like who am I, how many crazy past lives have I had? And, you know, what is the real story behind Cyrus? Maybe I'm not ready to find that out yet, but because I think it's a lot there. After all your experiences, after this life, do you want to come back here? Only if there's like some duty to fulfill, because I really don't think that's a good idea to come back. I think it's too too risky, too much pain and trauma and karmic types of problems that can happen. Mm. I think if, if, if possible, pretty good idea not to come back here. Although I think because we have such a desire to be growing and to be helping and, you know, these types of things that I wouldn't be surprised if I say that now. But in actuality, some part of me is going to keep spinning off and keep coming back again and again, because most of us do it. And uh, so, I, you know, so it's really, really difficult to uh, prognosticate like, oh, I will never want to come back here. I feel that way right now. Like right wow. now, there's no way I want to come back to this piece of crap planet. <laughs> but I think especially this big shifts and awakenings and things happening on the planet, mm -hmm. then, you know, that you know, if they don't all happen in my lifetime, I'm hoping they do then it might be, maybe it's necessary to keep coming back. I don't know. What do you think about um, people who are claiming to be star seeds and star seeds are coming here and raising, you know, trying to help the planet, heal the planet, and perhaps the ascension is going on? What is your opinion on all that? I do think it's true, like the Dolores Cannon stuff. I, I mean, I, I do think the essence of that is accurate. I think that there, that is a it, that is the motivating force behind a lot of people, maybe even myself, you know, um, coming here, incarnating and trying to usher something in because it's not going to happen by itself. So um, I think that is a big part of it. And I think it is happening. I just think, I, I, I just think that it's, there is, there's a lot less destiny than people think. I think there's so many different t competing timelines and it's all up to us. Mm. And we really have to get our act together with star seeds or whatever. Those star seeds have to really put themselves to work, not act like how Gen Zers act these days, you know, like being safe spaces and getting triggered by like pronouns or whatever the heck's going on. Like if you're coming here, you have to be a warrior and you have to, um, you know, represent, positive spiritual elements and really be focusing on elevating the planet up. And I think some people really are doing that, but there needs to be a lot of work done quickly and spreading interest um, to, a, to an even higher degree than, than it's being done right now, because even that plan I think can fail. Mm -hmm. So we don't want that to happen. <laughs> right. All right. Well, you've got that YouTube channel, you have books, you have the Facebook page. What inspires you to keep all this stuff going? Um, I think what inspires me is just seeing um, people who are unhappy. So people who have lost loved ones and they, you know, they can't recover from that. Seeing people who um, think this is all there is, who have depression because of like materialism and nihilism um, and all these types of problems. And um, I could have my experiences and that's great or know the things that I know and that's great. But then if, you know, if I have friends and family or people who are just suffering because the, this planet sucks and everyone's living in ignorance, then I just, I get, I, I say I get pissed off and then I feel like, well, I have to do something. I got to write a book or I got to make a video or I got to like keep, keep trying to help out because who wants to see everyone miserable and unhappy all the time? Yeah. All right, Cyrus, before we wrap it up here, do you have one last message that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I think the message I sent, I said before about keeping your sovereignty and uh, not venerating the other side is a really important one. So uh, be, I, would, I recommend there, there's a lot of wisdom in between the new age movement and consciousness studies and philosophy, but just be careful of falling into, for example, certain like, let's, let's say new age belief systems or venerating a particular person or taking like, let, let, let's say like maybe some popular, I don't know, like a YouTube channel or somebody and then venerating the person and obeying everything they, they say or do. Um, I think of the, the path of, I think what is like a spiritual progression has a lot to do with seeing everyone again as equals. So there's this kind of law of equality. And if you bypass that, you could be setting yourself up for either a lot of disappointment or possibly even danger. So be, you know, be, be very vigilant about who you follow, be vigilant about uh, cults of personality, 
be vigilant about being told how to live your life if it doesn't quite resonate with you. Like there was some channel, I won't, I won't name who, talking about cutting out like cutouts of uh, gray aliens and putting them in your room to help bring them in so you can be ascended to a UFO or something. I don't know. And I was listening to that and seeing how many people were following that. It's like, don't do that. Don't, 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 don't cut out gray aliens and put them in your house. We don't know what the gray aliens want. Don't give consent to random entities and bring them into your life. You know, um, you have a, have a relationship with, you know, with your higher self, your guides, your deceased loved ones, and people you care about that you have a loving connection to, but don't, don't throw your sovereignty away. So I think, I think anyone who gets involved in these areas should, should remember that. And don't fall into a spiral of paranoia either. There's just a lot of paranoia and fear-based spirals, and that's manipulation too. There's entities, including you know, incarnated entities in this world who feed off of fear and paranoia. So your loved ones, your deceased loved ones, not illusions. Yes, there could be reincarnation traps and things like that and soul traps, but you can bypass those simply with free will. Uh, the afterlife is actually an incredible and amazing place that we all could have access to but just stay f- freedom based in your in your mode of thinking and don't give consent to people don't fall into any of these traps where you think everyone's out to get you or you know that higher beings or divine powers are all actually evil and trying trying to manipulate you but at the same time don't think they're all good and you and then you just toss away your sovereignty to anyone who claims to be an angel so if there is that balance that we all have to work really hard to find because I'm seeing really imbalanced perspectives and ideas coming out of the spiritual um, uh, ecosystem that really worries me. Mm. So I, that's my main message. Wow. Well, Cyrus, thank you for that message. And thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for having me and uh, people watching. You can get in touch with me. I'm pretty easy to reach. All right. I wish you massive success on all you do and have a great evening. Until next time. Cheers. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.